11, so we can start. Um, good morning and welcome everyone to this talk by Dr. K.V. Subramanian on Indianizing Indian thought. Um, Dr. Subramanian is formal, formerly the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, um, is currently a professor at the Indian School of Business. Um, he's a PhD from Chicago Booths and a top-ranking IIT IIM alumnus, and he has brought several ideas to implement welfare programs effectively. Um, his push for the behavioral economics of nudge is acknowledged for its potential to bring behavioral change to India. And his idea of thalinomics, what a common person pays for a vegetarian or non-vegetarian thali, uh, has been acclaimed to be the Indian Big Mac Index. Uh, Dr. Subramanian has also been confirmed with the Distingu Distinguished Alumnus Award by his alma mater's IIT Kanpur and Nayan Calcutta. Apart from being the youngest chief economic advisor, Dr. Subramanian is among the youngest to receive this honor from his alma maters. And his research in banking, law, and finance, innovation, and economic growth, and corporate governance has been published in the world's leading journals. Without further ado, over to Dr. Subramanian. Very good morning, and thank you very much uh, to you all for inviting me to share my thoughts. Um, this is, as I as I've mentioned, uh, you know, in the brief as well. Uh, this is part of a larger uh, agenda, uh, research agenda, uh, part of which was started. You know, when I wrote the 2020 economic survey, those of you who are interested should go and read that uh, that survey. Uh, but more broadly, uh, you know, um, this is uh, part of actually my um, from my own reading. While of course um, having spent time at the University of Chicago and and in the U and in the United States, I've certainly been exposed to all the uh, literature that the West has to offer. Um, but I've also been fortunate enough to uh, read a lot of the Indian literature as well. And um, I've always believed that a scholar uh, must uh, really develop a very rounded view. Um, and, uh, you know, I have certainly not believed that literature is only what is written in English, um, especially coming from India with so much diversity and such, uh, you know, such extreme, such rich uh, literature written in Sanskrit and in, um, you know, and in other languages. And Sanskrit, by the way, is actually one of the oldest languages known to mankind, possibly, you know, as old as, as some of the other. Um, and my own mother tongue, Tamar as well, um, you know, the oldest language. Uh, um, so so uh, what I'm going to actually uh, share with you is part of, uh, you know, ongoing research, um, which, uh, which will eventually lead to at least one book, maybe more, um, you know, on, on, on these ideas. Uh, so, so that's that's what I'm going to share. Uh, one more thought, and this is something which is actually, you know, uh, while writing the economic survey, the 2020 economic survey, and, you know, which had carried liberal, uh, you know, uh, um, references to a lot of the Indian literature. Um, I, I actually also reminisce that during the decade that I lived in the United States and, traveled all over the world, one thing that struck me was whenever anybody anywhere, anywhere in the world started to ask some basic questions about human life, the country that they thought about was always India. And I think uh, many times, especially those of us who are, who are educated and especially those that are English educated, uh, typically um, or, you know, do not recognize our strengths as well. And this is also part of an effort, therefore, to, to make sure that we, we value what is our strengths um, as well. So uh, once again, thank you very much for, um, for, for inviting me. I'll, I'll have a presentation after that. I'd be very happy to answer questions. Um, let me just share my screen. Yeah, I hope it's visible. Um, so, let me start by something that intrigued me a lot. Um, you know, there was this um, research that uh, that that the, you know the, that that was published by you know this agency Pew Research, um, which showed you know about that ninety seven percent Indians believed God is important in their life, um, and this was significantly lower than that for advanced economies. When I looked at the proportions for the advanced economies, many of them were around 60%, um, you know, and as I mentioned, actually, I've already preambled through my own experiences, especially writing the economic survey, the 2020 economic survey. This question, especially from an economic perspective, has been something that I've been reflecting upon. Should India just, you know, uh, mimic or adopt Western culture values and institutions? 
institutions, especially given how rich we have been as a culture and as a society. Um, so some details, if you look at, you know, this is not just uh, in terms, you know, if you look by by various uh, by various religions as well, uh, you know, Hindus ninety eight percent, general population is ninety seven percent. This is again from the Pew Research. Um, Muslims ninety one, Christians ninety eight, six ninety four. Only the Buddhists were a little lower at sixty seven. Jains ninety nine. So there is actually a very large, you know, even across various uh, you know religious strata, the belief in God in India actually seems to be much higher than that in in advanced economies and and you know this is something which um, uh, this this kind of research did not exist in let's say in a 1990 or maybe in a 1950 but if you if it existed it would be very interesting to compare the time series how uh, you know uh, it would have been in the 1990s or 1980s and you know uh, um, I, I i don't have that data because that research does not exist but but anecdotally i think you know this is something that is quite you know, quite specific to India because, you know, uh, uh, this salient difference for India, I don't think is 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 because of material prosperity. Because historically, even when India was extremely prosperous, and I will give you evidence of that, you know, in the talk, Indians believed as much in religion, you know, and uh, so this and Sanatan Dharma was a way of life, not dogmas. Um, you know, that change with material prosperity, and that's that's one thing that you know, as somebody born with a scientific temper, somebody who went to engineering and learned the natural sciences, which, which inherently imbibes scientific temper in you, you know, these are uh, coming from a person who has basically always, you know, uh, um, respected scientific temper. And, you know, the, the, the Sanatan Dharma as a way of life and not dogmas is something that I've actually come to learn about, um, you know, in this discovery, path of discovery. Um, a question that I think, you know, is quite material, especially for India, as, you know, India celebrates its, 50, its 75th year and looks forward to India at 100, is will economics that is departed from the socio-cultural aspects of a society, will it deliver equitable and sustained, sustained development? Sustained development, even more important, especially in the context of challenges like climate change, um, you know, I, and, and other aspects. Um, you know, in other words, uh, can, can one do well by by trying to fit a square square peg into a round hole? Um, so, I, or or can economic development contra to a society's DNA be salutary? Which then begs the question: What is India's DNA? And I think that's what I'm going to try and spend uh, you know significant amount of time on. Um, you know, on on uh, trying to reflect on India's DNA. I will speak on the economic aspects as well, but the economic aspects actually really stem from the socio-cultural aspects and which I will, uh, you know, um, talk about. I had the good, you know, I had the, uh, the privilege of taking some, of, of sitting through some classes uh, you know, at the at the University of Chicago's Divinity School, um, and especially because comparative religion is something that interested me. Um, I used to sit through these classes, and actually, and therefore, you know, I've had the ability to sort of assimilate, um, you know, the way West progressed versus how, you know, um, and having read. Uh, you know many of the Indian literature as well. Um, you know how how India had been historically. So what I'm presenting actually is based on a lot of this very rich discovery um, that 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 has happened over over about two decades. Um, so uh, it, it, in India's DNA actually for me is a milieu of creativity and and liberalism underlying its economic thought. Um, liberalism that actually, you know, le that led to tolerance, to creativity, and to prosperity. Now, you have to be, you know, uh, careful, and I will actually, uh, you know, show this. A lot of us today, when we think about liberalism or liberal ideals, we use the definition that has been provided to us by the West, um, you know, but, but I think, you know, these ideals have very much existed in India, as I will try, try and try and illustrate through, uh, you know, through, through samplings from various parts of the Indian literature. Um, so uh, the, the thesis that I'm going to advocate using this, you know, uh, sampling of literature in the next few slides is that the liberal ideals that underlie India's society led to a tolerance level level of tolerance that was actually that the west can't even imagine about um, and that led to you know mind boggling creativity and prosperity uh, you know uh, uh, and, and and that's something which all of us have to actually reflect and understand um, so let me first start with the with the you know the, the liberalism to tolerance part let me show you some you know uh, sampling from the literature on this um, this is from the Maha Upanishad. Um, you know, in many of many speeches, 
many of you would have seen this these last two words being used or maybe in your homes as well you would have heard this word vasudeva kutumbakam but i think it is very important to understand many people talk about these two words vasudeva kutumbakam without actually you know recognizing the full context in which it was spoken about in the maha upanishads in the maha upanishad the shloka that comes is ayam nijaha paro veti ganana lagu chetasam udhar charitanam to vasudeva kutumbakam and let me you know because this is sanskrit some of you may may be familiar others may not be and let me just explain wherever i think is necessary in the interest of time i'll not you know go into each of the explanations but this one being very critical let me i am nijaha nijaha means actually mine i am nijaha this is mine paro veti you know that is not mine ganana is calculation i am nijaha paro veti ganana these are calculations made by lagu means small lagu chetasam chetana is consciousness so this this kind of calculation you know small minded calculations that this is mine and that is not mine is made by those with actually a limited consciousness in contrast and that's the second line here udara charitana udar means actually a very very expanded consciousness or a very broad minded consciousness udara charitana so we have broad minded broad character people for them udara charitana am to vasudeva kutumbakam that the entire world is a family and i think this idea that it is basically the large heartedness that leads to the entire world as a family india advocated this thought you know no other no other civilization you know uh, had the depth to be able to advocate this kind of thought look at uh, you know another another example of this this is from the garuda purana uh, sarvesham mangalam bhuya sarve santu niramayah sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashchit dukha bhag bhavet let all people live with pleasure everywhere let all people live without diseases let everyone feel themselves secure and let none have sorrow at any time this is not about actually you know prosperity or or you know lack of disease or fear for my clan or my country this is a prayer for all of humanity and that is something that actually has existed in the garuda purana from from time immemorial and that's again a second example of the kind of you know deep liberal thought that actually and you know and this is where i would actually define the western conception of liberalism and having read max weber uh you know and and on you know his his idea of basically the protestant ethic and how democracy and capitalism in the west evolved from the protesting ethic you know and often times liberal ideals in the west are thought about the separation of state from you know from religion or state from church um but the indian idea ideal of liberalism was of inclusiveness of of you know of, of infinite inclusiveness um not clannish where actually i pray only for my clan but for the entire of humanity and that is basically where the fundamental distinction that first we have to make um second actually and this is something again you know uh, as i was mentioning earlier you know in terms of my my own discovery you know if there is one document that has that i have been enormously influenced by you know in my own life actually and being able to live a, a happy fruitful life it is the bhagavad gita and i am going to quote here from the 18th chapter shloka 63 which actually again conveys you know what what we saw in the previous slide where macro ideas of liberalism now here look at it from an, at the micro which is individual level um, so here and i'm i'm just you know focusing on the last three words here yathe chasi tatha kuru you know yathe chasi that means what is what what you feel like tatha kuru okay now this is the bhagavad gita has 18 chapters at the end of the bhagavad gita having told you know to, to to arjuna krishna has basically advocated the three paths you know gyan mark karm mark and bhakti mark all kinds of you know knowledge is given him and then says at the end of this says thus has knowledge been declared declared to you by me i have given you all the knowledge reflect on it fully and act as you like act as you like now remember this is basically a conversation between supposedly you know uh, uh, the, the the lord himself and a disciple even the lord is not saying that you have to act this way even krishna does not threaten arjuna with any consequences or oh, if you don't do as i tell you actually these will be the consequences 
No, he's not saying that. Even Krishna does not threaten Arjuna about the consequences. Should Arjuna exercise his free will and judgment? He just says, you should do this. This is how, you know, if the wise people would behave. But even God is basically asking humans to exercise discretion and make a choice. So, you know, as I showed you in the previous slide, that was basically at the macro level, you know, inclusive, infinite inclusiveness. When you look at the individual level, micro level of an individual, again, you know, the, the liberal, you know, uh, 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 the thought to actually let the disciple decide for himself or herself after having, you know, shown him the way that this is how, you know, you should do. But if you want to act in a different way, definitely your free will to actually go ahead and act. And that again, you know, symbolizes a kind of liberal thought that I, that I'm in, to me, in fact, this symbolizes a pinnacle of liberal thought at the, you know, at the, at, 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 at the level of an individual. So that was basically at the micro and, and macro level on liberalism and tolerance actually for, for, you know, for dissonant thoughts. Um, now let's focus on creativity. And I think oftentimes, especially, uh, you know those who are uh, you know uh, uh, so for, for, from the from the liberal arts actually may appreciate some of these aspects of creativity far more than those of us who actually were more into engineering or sciences but you know uh, this is something which actually I've been able to uh, you know really marvel at um, so if you see and this is uh, so so palindrome you know many of us know is basically a sentence that is actually you, that you can it's read the same way backward or forward um, the sentence abel was i i saw elba this is often quoted as a great example of a palindromic sentence in english now note this is it's quoted as a great example of a palindromic sentence in english that as it can be read in reverse too now think about the idea that is that is underlying this is able was i i saw elba you know i mean nothing very profound about i was able i saw elba okay so you if you read it forward or backward it is it basically reads the same it's a six word palindromic sentence now look at the contrast uh, the ramakrishna viloma kavya this is by devagya surya pandit it's a 400 word palindromic composition where is six words where are 400 words and look at the able was i i saw elba nothing profound in that i saw i saw x i saw y what is so profound about that in contrast this 400 word palindromic composition this is it's called ramakrishna viloma kavyam viloma basically means opposite so when you read it forward it is the story of rama when you read it backward, it is a story of Krishna. The two most important characters, you know, in 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 uh, uh, in sort of you know in Indian uh, Indian mythology, Rama and Krishna. It's a composition that is of four hundred words, six words versus four hundred words. It's like almost you know uh, 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 60, 70 times more words. And look at the ideas there. You read it forward, it is the story of Rama. You read it backward, it is the story of Krishna. I'll give you just you know a couple of examples here. So this this particular sentence just I just picked it up from this Viloma Kavyam, which is Tam Bhusuta Mukti Mudarahasam Bandayeto Lavya Bhavam Dayashri. I pray to Sita, the incarnation of Lakshmi, who is affectionate towards a smiling lover, who is Sita's son. This is basically you know is is, is the story of Rama. Read backward, basically Sri Yadavam. You, you can actually follow it if you want. It is actually a palindromic composition. Shri Yadavam Bhavya Latoya Devam Samharada Mukti Muta Mukti Muta Subhutam. The teachings of Gita bestowed upon us by Lord Krishna, who draws people towards him with his benevolence, destroy evil, and are close to our heart. Now, just marvel at the creativity. Six words, and it is called great as a great example of palindromic versus 400 words, a one-liner with nothing profound. I saw X, I saw Elba was a big difference. I saw, I saw Subhu, I saw, you know, someone else versus I saw Elba and, you know, X was, X is able, Y is able, you know, someone else is able, nothing profound about it. In contrast, take the idea, you know, it's an innocuous idea versus the, you know, two talismanic characters, one, you know, red forward versus red backwards. Just reflect upon the profoundness 
and the depth. Um, and this, this is why, especially to you, you youngsters, actually, from someone who's actually, you know, uh, uh, basically read this, has, has gone to the same top universities in India and in the world. And so from someone like me telling you the kind of you know, wealth that exists in the Indian culture, you know, to basically uh, uh, reflect upon the profoundness and the depth. I think this is just one example. Uh, down south, I'll give you another example. This is Tirukkural, you know, it is basically in, in, a, in my mother tongue, Tamil. Tiru means holy. Kural means concise or abridged. And again, look at the creativity and, you know, of, of this composition. I'm going to give you some examples. You know, each chapter in the Tirukural has exactly 10 couplets, exactly 10 couplets. So if you're pointing, if you're reading shloka number or couplet number 53, you know it's from the sixth chapter because, you know, five tens are, five tens are 50, so five chapters done, 53 means it's the sixth chapter. Each of the 1,330 couplets contains exactly seven words. Imagine over, you know, 1,330 couplets, every one of those, cup, those couplets contains exactly seven words. The Tirukural starts from the first letter A, first letter in Tamil, which is A, and ends with the last letter in, in, in the Tamil alphabet. And, you know, what, what, what does it cover? It covers everything that a human needs to live, to live life king size. Basically, there are three parts of the Tirukkural. It's called Agattupal, Porulpal, and Kamattupal. For those of you who understand maybe from the South, Pal is actually means milk, but it also is interpreted as essence. So Agattupal is basically about stuff relating to, you know, material aspect, uh, 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 re relating to spiritual aspects. Purulpal is about material aspects and Kamattupal is about desires. Uh, and, and this is basically about, uh, uh, so, so, so three key parts, but written with basically each chapter having 10 couplets, each of those couplets having exactly seven words and starting with the first letter and ending with the last letter and so much actually you know i have liberally quoted reference tirukkural in the uh, economics of 2020 economic survey and other economic surveys as well so you know but there's a sea of knowledge here uh, to the extent that avayar who's actually a very famous poet of tamil nadu uh, basically describes tirukkural says that you know tiruvalluvar who's the who's the one who wrote it you know in 500 around 500 bc uh, Thiruvalluvar took wisdom equal to the water in the seven seas and compressed it into a mustard seed. That is what this, of course, very, you know, a poet basically is using that, you know, parallel so the metaphor so well, but the water of seven seas compressed into a mustard seed. That basically tells you about the creativity that there is, you know, uh, that, 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 that's existed in the, in the, in, in Indian thought. Um, now this is the, that's just a couple of examples of the creativity. Now let me go, you know, get on to the to the economic aspects of prosperity. Because and the reason I have covered all this is because you know in in any society the economics cannot be depart, departed from its society from 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 the socio cultural aspects and therefore understanding that is incredibly important. So the Indian you know uh, e economic thought actually emerged from these fundamentals of liberal thought, which actually enabled tolerance and led to mind boggling creativity that the West has, you know, basically doesn't even have us, a, a, you know, 1% of it yet, um, you know, and, and led to led to enormous prosperity as well. And I'm saying this based on facts, let, let you know, let, let, let's make sure that basically there is no, uh, you know, emotiveness in this. Um, so first, you know, on, on the prosperity. So look at this chart. This is, uh, this is the first chart, by the way, in the 2020 economic survey drawn from Angus Madison's work published by the Oxford University, uh, which shows, you know, of course, the time here on x-axis is time, but it is not linear because, you know, the first unit covers 1000 years. Um, and after that, you see actually, you know, a few units that cover 100 years and then actually it starts, you know, so that the, the units of time actually start getting compressed as you proceed along the x-axis. So, you know, you, the, the area of dominance here is not really, if you just take the area that doesn't capture the full time aspect of time, but it is, you know, quite interesting. You can see up until 1750 AD, and that is about this point, which is basically three quarters of known economic history. India was by far the largest contributor to world GDP. And in each one of those years, you know, for 17 and a half centuries, 
India accounted for at least one third of world's GDP. And this is, by the way, these are facts. This is not somebody, you know, talking about Sony ke chidiya, et cetera. These are, this is fact evidence provided by Angus Madison. And those who actually say, oh, it was because of population, you know, and this may come up in Q&A as well. In these societies, agrarian societies, population was endogenous. People moved to, you know, those places where there was prosperity. So I think you have to keep that in mind as well and not dismiss it just based on, you know, the, oh, that was just an aspect of population. Um, and, you know, unlike today, for instance, you know, where you could basically go and live in a desert as well, that was not possible given the technology that was available there. So don't dismiss it just based on, you know, because population is endogenous. So I, the, another important fact, you know, most of us actually uh, would aspire and say, oh, in India should become as prosperous as the, you know, and, and as, as prosperous as, let's say, the United States. Uh, you know, having lived there for a decade, actually, I've, I've, I've see, seen some of the prosperity there. Um, USA actually has been the, you know, largest contributor to world GDP for about half a century. And at its, you know, and, and on average, it has contributed about 28% to world GDP in this half, half a century period, approximately. But then compare and actually, again, reflect on it. India, you know, was this dominant power for 17 and a half century, which is 35 times longer. Now, that kind of dominance does not happen by accident. Again, that kind of dominance does not happen by accident. It comes only because of the kind of model, the kind of the economic model itself, which I will actually ex expatiate on significantly. It comes because of the kind of model that is being that is that is followed, uh, and and that's what I'm going to go into now. Uh, so if you go and look at you know the um, uh, uh, the Rig Veda, by the way, for instance, is the oldest document known to mankind. Um, and in the Rig Veda, there is a hymn that comes, which is called Sri Suktam. Many of you you know might recite it, or your parents or your grand grandparents might recite it. I recite it, and so you know I understand the significance of that. Um, but in the in Vedas, actually, you know there were these four purusharths, actually, or four noble pursuits that were that were talked about. Um, those four noble pursuits were dharma, earth, kama, moksha. Of which earth basically was, you know, one was 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 uh, the is basically that's material wealth. Um, so India was not a society that basically abhorred wealth or wealth creation. It is only the fifty year, forty odd years of socialist, you know, economy which basically when the, when the then prime minister said, "Don't ever uh, utter the word profit in front of me." It's a dirty word, um, and I'll speak about this later. Socialism itself as an idea is actually an import. It is not. You know, it came from the West, especially, you know, Karl Marx was German, for instance. So uh, India's DNA, as I'm going to you know, show in the next few slides, was always one that actually enabled or, or was, what, you know, one that, that enabled moral capitalism um, by marrying the hand of ethics um, with, the, with, with the hand of, you know, the invisible enter enterprise, Artha. So it was a marriage of Artha and Dharma, two of the, the noble pursuits. Um, and think about it actually as the following, you know, if think about the metaphor of a river and actually it's very important why dharma becomes so crucial to this metaphor will help you understand that when a river is well banked the water flows into areas where you know where it creates prosperity enables a lot of you know uh, good crops to be grown and uh, you know uh, uh, so creates prosperity but the same river if the banks are broken then water goes helter skelter and creates a lot of destruction. Um, so dharma is like that, you know, that that those banks that enables the flow of prosperity of economic activity for enhancing welfare rather than destroying welfare. And the global financial crisis actually, which has led to a lot of rethinking on economic models actually is an illustration of the banks of the river being broken of rapacious capitalism, uh, you know, and not, not moral capitalism, rapacious capitalism, basically, you know, le leading to a lot of destruction. So this is, you know, the Indian model of moral capitalism is actually quite apt um, for, 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 for basically sustained prosperity. And that's why if even if other countries don't implement it, at least India must be reflecting on it because that is basically what we have gotten, you know, and that is what made us so prosperous. Um, 
so it is basically that you know the marriage of these two that leads to the fulfilling of material desires and then you know leading to to liberation from um, you know from uh, which is something that india always actually you know focused on as well but this 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 sort of uh, um, stereotypical depiction of indian thought as only being concerned with moksha liberation after life not about the life here and now is actually a stereotype because you know as you will see you'll there are there in, you know if the the indian thought has been as much about moksha liberation as about desires here as well fulfillment of of desires here so that stereotyping actually is not quite right and when you start reading this you can actually you know start appreciating it so when you when you take what was india's model is actually a you know a, a comprised of these the economic model as it as i mentioned it flowed from the liberal ideals that led to tolerance and then led to mind boggling creativity uh, but on the economic side basically there were five main pillars markets and private enterprise uh, that is why in my term as a ca i have pushed for privatization you know significantly and the change in the indian economic policy atmanirbhar bharat policy that you know that that except for four or five strategic sectors government will get out of business is actually drawn from you know india's dna which has always been one that has enabled private enterprise markets and private enterprise you know i it's basically adam smith called it the invisible hand of markets the fact that you know you you, you have bread on you know uh, on on the breakfast table in the morning is not because of the compassion of the or the benevolence of the baker but because of the greed of the baker uh, uh, or well directed greed and that's basically what um, as you'll see uh, you know uh, a lot of the indian uh, literature talked about it much longer about 2 millennia before adam smith uh, you know advocated these ideas um, second you know indian indian dna was never one to abhor wealth or wealth creation it is only the you know uh, the, the socialist thought a lot of residual of it still remains you know uh, in 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 india uh, which 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 basically leads to abhorrence of wealth and and wealth creation but india always emphasized wealth that is actually generated by doing good by value add you know those those of you who are learning economics will will appreciate that there is a difference between rent seeking versus value creation wealth created by adding value is something that indian thought always you know uh, uh, um, encouraged but rent extraction was always something that actually you know was 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 discouraged um, and you know sustainable growth actually if you think about climate change it is actually in some way if you grow you know if you create wealth by destroying the the, the climate that is actually a model of rapacious capitalism of rent extraction not one where you are adding value necessarily uh, but the indian model was one that focused on sustainable growth and i'll i'll give you instances of that you know when you go a little bit more down at the micro level property rights you know any capitalistic model at its center is property rights it actually epicenter is property rights and this is something that the indian thought always respected in contrast to the rapacious you know uh, uh, thought that actually had prevailed and i'll give you examples of that in the in, in the in the western paradigm and finally role of state uh, taxes and public goods uh, and and you know the thought that so these are the aspects that i'll cover on the on the economic side um, so <clears throat> india's traditional economic thinking and emphasized enabling markets and enable and eliminating obstacles to economic activity so uh, arthashastra which was written 2 millennia back um, adam smith coined the idea that you know invisible hand of market the fact that the the baker baker's greed actually is what puts bread on the table which is essentially the idea that private enterprise is what leads to wealth creation in society this idea arthashastra actually advocated Two millennia before Adam Smith. So while uh, you know most, uh, um, and I, I've I've learned economics myself, you know, um, at the University of Chicago. Uh, but you know, if if most people will regard Adam Smith as the father of economics, but now having learned so much, if you ask me, I would say Cortilla is actually the father of of, of economics because these ideas were very much there, you know, two millennia back. Um, and and it's not just me saying it, you know. Uh, uh, David Spengler in this book in 1971 published by the Duke University Press he says and i and i quote from there it is in the arthashastra that economic discussion was most highly developed much more fully than one finds it in classical greek economics 
And you know, again, I'm quoting from Spengler's book. Where basically, he says, Cortilia said, uh, you know, the root of wealth is economic activity, and lack of it brings material distress. Just reflect on it. This is, I think, what any economist today would actually, you know, say, say it. Uh, but this was said two millennia back. That root of wealth is economic activity, and lack of it brings material distress. Absent fruitful economic activity, both current prosperity and future growth are in danger of destruction. This was said two decades, uh, two millennia back by, by, by Cortilia. And crucially, you know, in the context of this ease of doing business that we, that we talk about, the World Bank started these ease of doing business rankings two decades back. Um, you know, in, in, <laughs> interestingly, that has also been subject to rent extraction. And, you know, many of you might have followed some of the, you know, the, 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 the controversies on that. Um, but, but the fact that the king should work to remove all obstructions to economic activity. What is ease of doing business? It is just basically the idea that remove all obstructions to economic activity. You know, regulate the economic activity well so that things like monopolies, you know, and rent, rent extraction does not happen, but remove all other obstacles to economic activity. That is what ease of doing business is. And this was, you know, declared and postulated by Cortilia in the, you know, two millennia back, basically during the, you know, the Maurya Empire, you know, this was the advice he used to give to Chandragupta Maurya uh, to remove all obstructions to economic activity. Uh, and, and this work actually was quite influential in India, you know, in its economic model till 12th century, uh, which is basically acknowledged by Olivelle in, in, in the, this Oxford University Press book, um, you know, published in 2013. Um, the, the, if you look at not just in terms of the ideas, but what India did actually in, you know, in enabling private enterprise. Um, so it, it, a trade or which is basically done by private, private act, you know, actors was a key contributor to in ancient India's prosperity. Uh, internal and external trade was done through two major highways, Uttarapatha or the Northern Highway and Dakshina Partha or the Southern Highway. So India at that time had built these highways to enable trade. Not only, you know, inland trade was done like that, but there were ports that were connected, you know, that connected India to Egypt, Rome, Greece, Persia, and Arabs to the West, and with China, Japan, and Southeast Asia to the East. So, you know, this was also done to enable trade. So private enterprise that actually enabled trade was what India, you know, uh, uh, focused enormously on historically Tra trade was carried out by trade was carried out by large corporatized guilds that are akin to today's multinationals today we marvel at the apples the microsofts of the world but you know in in the in 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 uh, india's history these activities were carried out by corporatized guilds which were funded by tam temple banks and you know today now there's there's research emerging that temples were very important you know centers of economic activity where money used to come in actually in the form of donations and that used to be you that used to be employed for funding these economic activities um, that were done by large corporatized guilds um, and in fact you know in the, the arthashastra you know the uh, kautilya says as well that basically he specifies the duties of the king superintendent of commerce which basically in today's world would be the commerce minister um, and what does he say? He says, mariners and merchants who import foreign merchandise shall be favored with remission of trade taxes so that they may derive some profit. Not only that, he would, you know, uh, Cortilla also mentioned that in the, you know, urban planning, there should be quarters for foreign traders to come and stay as well, stay comfortably so that they are attracted to come and actually, and, and you know, sell their wares uh, to, to Indian, you know, to Indian customers. So wealth and commerce actually were quite intrinsic to India's DNA and India actually did build the infrastructure to enable this kind of trade. Um, it, and, and, you know, now the, the, I talked about the hand of ethics, and this is very important because, you know, in the Indian thought, it was recognized very well that the hand of ethics or dharma was very important to avoid matsya nyay. Matsya nyay, matsya means basically in Sanskrit means fish, nyay is law, the, uh, which is symbolic of the law of the jungle. But, you know, when, when you think about matsya nyay, the big fish eat the small fish. That is basically the law of the jungle. And that creates a lot of negative externalities as well. So you know, the Indian thought was very much aware that laissez-faire would lead to matsya nyay. And therefore, it is important to actually 
regulated, but by aspiring to dharma at the at the individual level, and also for the king to actually you know em, enforce laws to, to to foster dharma in society. Uh, Tiruvalluvar in the Tirukkural actually this is verse seven fifty four. He says and look at look you know look at and, and you know focus on this. He basically says wealth yields righteousness and joy. The wealth acquired capably without causing any harm. You know, he's very clearly saying that wealth that you basically go and acquire by maybe you know polluting rivers or polluting the environment that obviously causes harm. So he's saying you you know create wealth, but create wealth not by causing harm to others. So you know things like pollution, externalities due to climate change, actually where you know obviously they were not phenomena that were there at that time, but the concept of of basically you know uh, of of not causing harm was was very much there. In fact, you know, today as well, if you, those of you who can, you know, um, relate to this, um, if you go to, you know, to the altar of your home, many times you will find these two words written in in the altars at our homes, which is shub lab. We don't go and write there basically, you know, shub hani. Nor do we go and write ashub lab, right? Shub means basically auspicious. Lab means profit. And how is it? Basically, this is you know, if you think about it a little bit more deeply, this part of culture that has come to us is because of some deep thinking that was done. You know, examples of which I've given to you today. So we write shub lab. You know, we don't write. You know, we don't say profit is a dirty word. We write lab actually. And nor do we say that we you know make profit in any which way and say you know ashub lab. We write shub lab, and which actually conveys this symbiotic relationship between you know between making profit but doing good or more. capitalism in fact actually you know to give credit where it is due even adam smith and and this is something that the west has unfortunately forgotten if you go and read his 1759 you know uh, book the theory of moral sentiment adam smith basically says you know combine moral living and reasonable look at the what i put it on red reasonable pursuit of material desires not the credo of greed is good as the new york times proclaimed in the in 1980s or the model of rapacious rapacious capitalism that you see today that you know make wealth at any any cost it was basically about moral living and i think this is a, an aspect that very very important when i reflect on economics and having actually now learned economics and 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 done research when i reflect on overall you know the where where the modern where the modern economics profession is that basically you know it it there is value neutrality and i think when one thinks about economics as a part of society and how it should contribute to society i actually think that this is something that the economics profession itself has to be has to be has to has to be thought about and indian thinking actually indian thought always you know thought, thought about it and basically thought about dharma as actually the way of enabling enabling virtue enabling morality in society uh, I, and i think you know the fact that things like the global financial crisis the indian banking crisis clearly illustrate the importance of dharma why because in having done some of my work my, some of my research has been in the world of incomplete contracts you know the 2018 nobel prize in economics was given to to oliver hart um, for his work on incomplete contracting now basically what oliver hart showed was that in you know that that uh, uh, real world contracts are intrinsically incomplete and because real world contracts are intrinsically incomplete you cannot actually just through incentives for instance you cannot uh, really uh, uh, you know uh, 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 sort of take care of the first first best outcome we you know in economics we always have what a social planner would want the first best outcome and especially intrinsic motivation you know often there is a lot of research in economics that also shows that many times actually incentive contracts can drive away can crowd out intrinsic motivation huh? and you know the concept of dharma in contrast actually does not suffer from these problems and that is why i think you know this is something that that really helped uh, in indian thought was intrinsic to indian thought in fact you know today if you look at research after the global financial crisis my my phd advisor luigi zingales has been at the center of a lot of this research you know he basically talks about global financial crisis as a failure of trust um, and you know basically trust as a mechanism itself um, you know if you if you dig a little deeper ethical behavior is what leads to trust you know if you think about moral trust as a as a repeated game you know uh, there are there's work in economics that does that as well um so you know in in and and this is the other sec the second key part so to summarize you know the th- i've talked about five pillars i've spoken about two pillars so far first was private enterprise you know and markets 
Second was sustainable growth, not rapacious capitalism or you know, second moral capitalism or you know, sustainable growth. Third is, is wealth and wealth creation. You know, and, and here, if you look at basically, as I mentioned, the Rig Veda is the oldest text that is known to mankind. Uh, a hymn that comes in the Rig Veda is, is Sri Suktam, which is basically a hymn to you know, worship the goddess of wealth, Mahalakshmi. Mah Mahalakshmi, you know, all of you would know, is basically known as the goddess of wealth. Um, uh, and, and in this, um, you know, in, in, the, in the Sri Suktam, there is a part that comes in the end. It says, Dhanyam, Dhanam, Pashum. Bahuputra Labham Shatasamvatsaram Dirghamayu. That is basically the, the benediction or blessings that is being give, given. Dhanyam is basically cereals in an agrarian society that was important. Um, dhanam, which is actually wealth or maybe gold coins. Uh, dhanyam, Dhanam, Pashum. Again, in an agrarian society, cattle was important. So the blessing of cattle, you know, the uh, Pashum. Bahuputra Labham, actually, you know, again, given mortality being very high at that time, many kids was also actually a blessing that was given. And finally, long life. Shata Samvatsaram Dirghamayuhu, basically long life extending up to 100 years. This, these are all, none of this is about afterlife. This is all about actually living life well here and now in this life. And that is basically something that the Rig Veda, the oldest text known to mankind, actually talks about. Um, and, you know, Tirukkural, as I said, actually, you know, uh, around 300 B, you know, BC, talked about this as well, um, that wealth, the lamp, unf unfailing speeds to every land, dispersing darkness at its Lord com Lord's command. You know, this is not a culture that basically says, you know, wealth is a dirty word or profit is a dirty word. That's what, this is what is our culture. It's like, you know, verse 759, make money. There is no weapon sharper than it to severe the pride of your foes. So practical, if you think about it, even today, I think is equally applicable. Make money. There is no weapon sharper than it, sharper than it to sever the pride of your foes. Spoken about almost 2300 years back. Uh, and words, you know, in, in, in the... Uh, 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 105th, uh, 100, 104th chapter, verse 1040, Mother Earth will laugh at the prospect of those who plead poverty, but lead an idle life. And I think, again, you know, Purushartha is something that, or, or hard work is something that is being basically talked about here 2300 years back. As I mentioned, profit was never a dirty word. So this is basically what, you know, the Indian thought has been of, wor of worshipping wealth, but wealth, you know, uh, made through good means, ethical means, dharmic means. Um, and, and dharma, by the way, actually is, you know, is seen as not as not a religious connotation, but basically the immutable laws of the universe. So, you know, uh, uh, making wealth by, while respecting the immutable laws, laws of the universe. Um, now, last two aspects, which I'm going to focus on, which is property rights and also the role of the state taxes, etc. Now, here I want to distinguish, you know, the, 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 the thought that, that came about on property rights in the West vis-a-vis -vis what prevailed in India. And, and you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier as well, a capitalistic society, I know at, at the core of it is property rights. Um, it, it's only in socialistic society where basically property rights are not respected. So now look at the contrast here, the Western principle of eminent domain. Eminent domain actually means, you know, sort of a kind of sovereignty allows governments to confiscate land from landowners. You know, it's an eminent domain itself is a Latin phrase that means supreme lordship or ultimate sovereignty of, of God. Roman law and Magna Carta of 1215 uh, AD recognized eminent domain for the state. In other words, basically what this gave is that the state can go and grab land at the pretext of development or maybe just in a rapacious manner. Eminent domain gave that right to the state and thereby basically justified rapacious behavior you know, by, 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 by the state. In contrast, the Shukla Yajur Veda in the chapter 40th, 40th chapter basically says that even king must not appropriate others' wealth. So others' wealth, a person's wealth is his property. King cannot go and appropriate. That is basically a spec of private property, property rights. Similarly, Sage, you know, Narada, I'm sure many of you basically would have, Narada, many, many of you would have heard about, if not from your parents, from your grandparents. Um, in his Dharma Shastra, which is called Narada Smriti, he says that the householder's living space and his field are considered as the fundamentals of his existence. Therefore, let not the king take either of them, for that is the root of householder. Again, respect of private property. 
in fact adhering to this principle uh, gautami putra satkarni uh, basically was satavahana dynasty's emperor who ruled in india in the first century he actually bought a tract of land uh, did not use the concept of eminent domain saying i am the emperor and therefore you know eminent domain con- gives me the right to go and confiscate land as you know roman law and magna carta um you know you basically uh, uh, enabled uh, the western society to do no he basically went and bought a tract of land along along these lines um, and and that basically tells you that property rights which as i said you know if you go and read a lot of the economics literature as well it is at the heart of actually of 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 capitalistic society uh, you know a society that enables private enterprise or encourages private enterprise and that was actually part of indian thought um finally when you uh, a few more thoughts on basically on on the role of state capital etc look at the ideas on capital and again in a capitalistic society capital itself is regarded as very important you know when you think about production functions in economics you have labor capital and you have total factor productivity on capital what did what was indian thought uh, you know in the shanti parva in mahabharat uh, it basically you know book 12 chapter 8 says wealth brings about accession of wealth the way domesticated elephants are used to capture wild elephants so you know current wealth brings about more wealth so you know future wealth is basically uh, uh, equated with wild elephants current wealth is equated with domesticated elephant so the way domesticated elephants are used to capture wild elephants you know current wealth can actually bring about more wealth as well so this was basically the idea that wealth is important to put it you know put into production to generate more future wealth in contrast you know a very very uh, a tall scholar whom actually all of us have enormous respect for aristotle you know said that money is barren and cannot produce money uh, look at the important difference basically in the uh, you know in the way wealth was thought about in indian thought vis-a-vis the way it was actually thought in western in the western paradigm in fact actually capturing the idea that wealth you know has a uh, potential to generate more wealth the grammarian panini you know who's basically uh, the person to have great created sanskrit grammar expressed interest payments in percentage terms in 700 bce uh, that's you know about about 2700 years back now remember today we basically take percent percent which is per 100 as basically part of our you know of, of, of as common parlance but 2700 years back he basically expressed interest payment saying if you borrowed 100 rupees this is the interest you will pay which is the idea of rental cost of capital that if you basically because you know capital today can actually generate capital in future so when i give you my capital there is an opportunity cost and you have to pay me for that op- opportunity cost and that is what you know panini did in expressing interest payments you know 2700 years back so look at the money is barren and cannot produce money vis a vis wealth to, you know current wealth leads to future wealth and therefore the rental cost of capital which is interest payments look at the important distinction here so capital and rental cost of capital and therefore the importance of capital itself was part of india's dna property rights i've talked about i've talked about capital as well which again tells you how private enterprise and you know capitalism was what was india's dna um if you look at you know the state taxes and role of state taxes itself you know again you see the difference between rapacious capitalism the way it has gotten imbibed in the west vis-a-vis the indian model of moral capitalism so um in this is a quote from from the mahabharat shanti parva where he's basically the you know it, it said that a king should tax his kingdom like a honey bee gathering honey from flowering plants um this is basically the metaphor now honey honey bee we all know when it goes and collects honey from a plant it cross fertilizes in the plant in the process and therefore this is a metaphor of give and take similarly you know kalidasa most of most of us would know about kalidasa those of those of us who studied in cbsc would have actually learned his poems as well you know you know sanskrit classes if you took sanskrit um the famous poet kalidasa in raghuvamsam basically says that the state collects tax for the greater welfare of its citizens in the same way as sun evaporates water to form clouds only to return it manifold in the form of rain so evaporate some water to form clouds but returns it back manifold in the form of rain look at the metaphor here one that is symbiotic between the state and its citizens 
and contrast it to this quote by Jean Baptiste Colbert. Jean Baptiste Colbert was the finance minister of, um, of, of French King uh, uh, Louis the Fifteenth, um, and and he coined this you know this metaphor for taxation, which said the art of taxation consists in plucking the goose so as to procure the largest quantity of feathers with the least possible hissing. Again, just contrast the metaphors. You know, let me pluck as many feathers as possible while making the you know the goose he's you know his le the least. So basically, you know, extract as much as possible while trying to make sure that it does not hiss that much and and, and trouble me. That's the con you know concept of taxation. There, look at that you know that, that the similes. It's you know simile of pluck plucking the goose is exploitative. Simile of honeybee and cloud capture the symbiotic relationship. Unfortunately, a to a today a lot of our thought has actually you know lost a lot of the very profound thinking that 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 basically India had in its DNA. And part of my my effort is basically to try and bring some of these back you know through scholarly research. Um, so. Similarly, if you basically look at, you know, Mahabharata again in this Sabha Parva, uh, Sage Narada asks King Yudhishthira saying, have large water tanks been constructed at periodic distances to tackle water scarcity in the rain fed areas of the country? So this is basically public good, water tanks as public good, Narada asking, asking the king. Tirukural actually, Tirukural something, you know, something I referred to, you know, mentions that the power of those who perform penance is the power of enduring hunger. It is inferior to the power of those who remove the hunger. So again, actually, the activities of removing hunger, you know, being placed on a higher pedestal than those that actually perform penance uh, while enduring hunger. So you know, aspects of public goods and actually public service being talked about in in Indian thought. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll end with uh, you know a couple of more slides. There are more slides, but in the interest of time, I'm going to, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop just a couple of slides. Uh, I think it is important to understand why India went, you know, um, into still after 1750, uh, why India went, you know, the, uh, uh, the way it did. Um, I think imperialist era policies actually were once, the British policies were ones that really undermined markets. Um, you know, um, Dadabha Inaroji and R.C. Dutt have, have written about it extensively. Uh, that British economic policies distorted markets in Britain's favor at India's expense. They imposed tariffs that favored British exports at the expense of Indian entrepreneurs. The, the exchange rate was kept artificially tilted so that the trade surplus could be could go to Britain. In in the way today, you know, for instance, if you look at the U.S. China trade war, when you know U.S. accused China of actually keeping its exchange rate artificially. Um, uh, artificially low to actually you know, enable exports. So similarly, Britain did that. And, you know, many scholars have written about this British era. On the one hand, they actually undermine markets. But on the other hand, look at the hypocrisy and something which oftentimes I'm actually not surprised by, given the current Ukraine crisis and actually some of the quantifications that come as well, um, you know, on India's stance in the UN. Um, you know, faced with famine, they rationalized non-intervention, saying intervening would violate principles of free trade and free enterprise. And I think the hypocrisy here is basically not even surprising me. Um, so on undermining of markets and trade, you know, uh, not enabling markets and trade on the one hand led to the economic decline, but to, you know, they basically rationalized not intervening when there was a famine to, based on principles of, you know, free trade and free enterprise. And I think, you know, uh, uh, that basically sort of captures uh, the the duplicity uh, and and the undermining of markets that leads to that led to India's decline. Uh, you know, if, uh, after independence as well, and I think again there's a lot of scholarly work now. Uh, uh, Arvind Birmani, former CEA, has written extensively on this. Basically, so you know, saying that slow GDP growth, you know, for 40 years up until 1991 was due to the all per pervasive state control and command sh you know, shackling economy. Um, you know, uh, many, many very, very deep thinkers like C. Rajagopalachari, B. R. Shina, et cetera, actually warned at that time against the dangers of the, of the socialist model. They advocated the model of private enterprise competition and markets as was being pursued by Japan, France, and West Germany, and look where they are today. Um, you know, and and but but they were not listened to. In fact, Milton Friedman actually, you know, had come, um, had visited both India and Singapore. You know, he delivered a talk um, at at the planning commission, 
his talk just remained a talk never got implemented in contrast he went to singapore you know there uh, the uh, his 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 ideas were implemented and look where singapore is today uh, and, and in in india in contrast his talk just remained talk and you know uh, profit was de decreed as a dirty word in fact the economic idea of socialism itself was an import, imported idea as i mentioned it is not you know part it's it's antithetical to india's dna which enabled private enterprise as i just mentioned um so i'll 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 stop here and then there are more slides actually about the current fiscal policy sir which i don't have time to go over but let me just quickly summarize um if we have time i might go you know maybe in q and a we might go through um in some you know india's uh, tradition has been one of been a very rich one of deep thought uh, reflecting liberalism and creativity but liberalism defined not in the you know in the western notion of separation of state from religion but liberalism defined as you know and the, at the macro level of you know infinite inclusiveness and at the micro level basically you know in uh, uh, action or or you know uh, 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 allowing freedom of freedom of action uh, based on one one's temperament um, uh, and and this kind of liberalism is what led to unparalleled creativity um, uh, and 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 the economic ideas that evo evolved from this indian thought was one of basically private enterprise moral capitalism that led to unparalleled prosperity um, you know as i showed up until 1750 ad india accounted for you know at least one third of world gdp consistently consistently uh, for 17 and a half centuries in other words three quarters of known economic history india was by far the largest contributor to you know to to to, to world gdp and moving away from this dna of moral capitalism is what has led to our decline during the imperial era and then after actually during the socialist period as well and and unfortunately a lot of the residual of the socialist thinking still persists today uh, and i think it is important that we indians go and learn what is our dna uh, now of course there is a conscious effort being made to to go back to our dna in the, you know several of the reforms that have been done um, and uh, you know the the the, the ca capital expenditure driven growth so many of these are basically implementing ideas that that uh, you know that that were, were part of india's dna so i have no doubt that india at 100 beckons and this decade will be uh, you know a decade of unparalleled growth because of the reforms that were done during the you know during the covid era and and, and I'll, i'll stop with that thought while every other country in the world was just trying to scramble you know to get over the covid period india unleashed reforms during that period and i had the privilege of being you know of participating in that reform process so if you summarize 1991 was product reforms product market reforms this set of reforms are all factor market reforms factor market of capital labor um, you know economies of scale uh, exports etc so that's basically what um, so which will lead to uh, you know very high growth uh, in the in the in the coming decades so india at 100 beckons uh, i'll stop there thank you very much for your patient listening oh thank you so much for the talk professor we'll just get into questions if that's okay with you with quite a few um so the first question is uh, professor you talked about india's historic creativity and inclusivity um, according to you how can we today help our minority communities improve their economic conditions and also do you feel that the current reservation system is effective see on the <clears throat> on the reservation system i think you know we need far more research um, on 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 i will not speculate on that absent good evidence um, i think there are clearly um, those that are being res given reservations have been people who have been you know um, who have basically been de deprived opportunity often you know more than inequality of outcomes inequality of opportunity is what often times is actually is a far uh, far more uh, you know um, uh, ethical wrong um, and i think uh, therefore um it, it, even if you look at in the united states for instance they even in the united states they do follow you know uh, uh, um, uh, policies basically aimed at uh, you know sort of uh, encouraging those that have been wronged against for instance you know the uh, uh, the african americans uh, so 
I think these are uh, the second question on on reservation is something that you know we need far more research on. Uh, I think the idea of um, giving reservations to those that are economically backward uh, that was brought about uh, by the current government is a good one um, because uh, you know we need to start refining some of the uh, you know some of the policies so that those that are genuinely you know uh, distressed uh, get that reservation. Um, as for the first question on minorities, I think, you know, and this is something which um, I've, I've looked at evidence, I've, I'm yet to, you know, publish it because I'm sort of working on it. You know, if I don't know how many of you recall, but in the 2021 economic survey, we, the last chapter there was access to basic necessities, access to the bare necessities. Um, we developed an index, you know, of access to bare necessities, um, which included food, you know, which included clothing, uh, good environment, you know, housing, uh, you know, sort of mosquitoes, cleanliness, you know, are they there? And we found there actually, and this is by the way, not administrative data of the government. This is survey data, which is actually, you know, done by the NSO. And so independent of the, of the government, we saw that access to bare necessities have actually improved for the minorities far more from 2014 to 2020 than in previous periods. And that's something which, you know, um, this is evidence, by the way, and I think we have to be, um, and I, uh, one thing I do mention, you know, science always evolves in a Bayesian manner, which is that, you know, when you, we all have our priors, which is fine. But when we, when we look at compelling evidence, basically we should look to update our priors. So that's the evidence. Um, and I think if, you know, uh, um, those of us, especially from the elite, that basically say that, oh, the, you know, the election outcomes are actually something that we cannot, you know, the, we, we, we know we are all educated people, we know how to work, vote, the, the others don't know how to vote. Basically, I think that, that, that conveys an arrogance that I think, which is basically uh, completely misplaced. Um, if we basically look at Indian electoral outcomes, governments that have not delivered, have been booted out and that is why the word in you know anti incumbency if there are governments that are coming back you know and some of the evidence seems to suggest even because of you know some of the minorities basically supporting as well i think you know this is something that is clearly uh, uh, has to be looked at i would say there's more evidence that is required more research that is required ideally we should not be going by anecdotal evidence i will point out one you know, at ISB, one of my colleagues has actually been doing some research, looking at the coverage of 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 you know violent incidents. Um, you know, when it in, when when it involves a minority versus a majority community, and using you know text mining algorithms, etc. What is quite interesting, actually, I think this is it's still work in progress, which is if you basically read the English media and look at the same incident that is the way it's reported in the vernacular media, you'll find that there is basically systematic differences. If it is basically a minority community, you know, that was basically adversely affected, um, it's reported, actually, the names are reported in the English me you know, in media, but when it's the other way around, where it's actually the, the, the this distressed uh, section is a majority community, names are systematically taken out in the English reportage, you know, while, while in the vernacular media, it is reported as is. So these are aspects, again, that we need systematic research. Some of you who are actually interested in such research, we need to, I think, you know, uh, um, re, what, th these, these opinions that we form, we must be forming it based on very careful research, not on anecdotes. And actually, that is a larger thought I want to leave you all with. Um, you know, when I read, read this very, very nice book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, um, a, a summarization that I did for myself was the difference between good thinking and bad thinking is all about three A's. Um, good thinking is about averages and, 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 and aggregates. Bad thinking is about anecdotes often. Um, so I think we have to be careful not just to basically, you know, overinterpret anecdotes, um, look at aggregates and averages before. Now, aggregates and averages, by the way, are necessary not sufficient for good thinking but anecdotes are certainly anecdotes neither fulfill the necessary condition nor the sufficiency condition for good thinking thank you for that answer professor uh, we've got another question um, you've quoted only hindu brahmanical texts as indian thought um, i have two questions uh, first the idea of india did not exist 
um, until two centuries ago. Um, in that much, how is this Indian thought and not Hindu thought specifically? Um, second and relatedly, a large chunk of the period you quoted when India dominated the global economy, uh, a large part of this land was ruled by non-Hindu rulers who may or may not have subscribed to the Hindu ideology that you have referred to as the Indian DNA. Uh, can this ideology then be credited for all of India's historical economic prosperity? So, of course, this is, a, this is a larger debate that, you know, we need to get into. I think uh, I will not be able to do justice to this question in, you know, in the maybe minute or two that we have. And I think, you know, the idea of India, Bharat Varsh, Bharat Varsh is actually, you know, um, has existed much more, much longer. You know, of course, the India, you know, the way it's defined in the constitution was done after independence. But, you know, for instance, and by the way, let me be, make, let me make it very clear. There is no Brahminical part to it. Vedas basically are not just ones that are basically for Brahmins. Um, let's be very clear. You know, these are these basically have been. Uh, you know, there are many many scholars and saints who actually come from not you know non Brahmins who actually you know attained very you know attained the pinnacle of wisdom um, from other communities. So I think uh, this, uh, this, this mischaracterization is something that we have to be very careful about. Uh, the, the Bhagavad Gita, which actually is one that I'm influenced by, it actually is a discussion between, you know, Krishna, who's basically supposed to be Yadava, and Arjuna, who's basically a Kshatriya. There is no Brahmin there. Um, so I think, you know, let's be, a, let's be a little bit more careful in not trying to put caricatures that are actually not apt. Um, and uh, if, if anything, you know, the, the uh, and by the way, that's the other thing, the Bhagavad Gita that I quoted liberally from actually is as applicable today as it was two, two millennia back or maybe even beyond. Uh, so I think you have to be careful in, you know, not use your anecdotal, evidence and the stereotypes that you formed in your mind actually peddle that as evidence. Um, I think anecdotes have to be basically considered as anecdotes. Stereotypes should not be made based on anecdotes. So, um, and, you know, this is something which, um, see, when, uh, the, when, when we do uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, in any, any uh, sankalpa that is done in the no, I, this is, of course, I'm saying from the Hindu perspective, I will come to other, uh, you know, th uh, thoughts as well. Um, so when we do a sankalpa, we basically say, for, you know, in, in Sanskrit, this is said, mama upatta, samastha, durajak, shetvara, sri, parameshu, like that, it goes. And it, there it comes Bharata Varshe. You know, it basically comes, so the word Bharata actually comes very much, there's the idea of India as a nation, India as a civilization, India as a society has existed long before, you know, and actually has, that's something that has, that has come to us. Now, as examples of other thought, I refer to the, I'll, I'll ask you to go and take a look at the economic survey, the 2018-19 economic survey, where, you know, we had quoted on this concept of willful default. Uh, you know, in the, of course, in the Hindu scriptures, there's basically talk about how a loan is an obligation that has to be paid. It's very interesting, even in Christianity and in Islam, the idea of debt, something that has to be repaid, is talked about very well. Um, and and uh, for instance, you know, in the uh, in 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 Islam, when a person passes away, there is this practice, um, you know, uh, um, where the, they they come with basically when the, before the last journey of that person, they'll come around with actually uh, you know a, a con um, a, with with a container having you know. Uh, currency rupee note saying if this person borrowed some money from you please take it now so that this person's last journey can be without debt um, so this idea as i said you know has existed in you know hinduism buddhism jainism but even in islam and similarly jesus has also talked about actually talked about the debt of love but not don't ever have the debt of you know monetary debt and saying monetary debt is basically something that is a sin so ideas like these i actually given my exposure to this you know this uh, these these um, uh, uh, this literature i have of course drawn far more from the hindu scriptures but i am equally you know uh, I'm, I'm equally confident that similar ideas will very well exist you know, in, in other religions. I am not a scholar in those others. Actually, I have not gone and read those. And that is why I have to actually acknowledge my, my limitation in not being able to draw on, on those. Wherever I have been exposed to those ideas, actually, I have you know, drawn on that as I give the example of the economic survey as well. Thank you so much for that answer, Professor. Um, another question is, what is your view on human capital in India? 
Do you think we need more Indian economists trained in the Indian thought than in the Western thought? And are economic policies better planned if one contextualizes them in India than in Western case studies? So I, I think let, let me be very careful here, right? So um, I let me I don't want my talk to be mistaken, you know, in 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 any in any of the following ways. I think the Western rigor, uh, which is something that I had the privilege of imbibing um, by studying at the University of Chicago, that rigor in research is actually something that is incredibly important. Um, but at the same time, India's policies have to be actually catered to India's, you know, a uh, 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 socio-cultural and India's stage of development as well. I think just cut pasting stuff from other countries is not good, you know, using that rigorous method of, of research thinking, we have to basically think ab initio for what is right for India. Your question was posed in the context of human capital. Of course, I think, you know, healthcare and education are two key areas that, you know, matter for human capital and something that we have to really, uh, you know, uh, work on. Those of you who are interested in the 2021 economic survey, I think the fourth or the fifth chapter was on healthcare. Um, you know, I, if, if, if I remember right, the chapter in volume one, the chapter was titled Healthcare Takes Center Stage, Finally. Um, and, you know, and I would refer you to that chapter to look at not only did it analyze the status of healthcare, you know, uh, across across the country, but also had a lot of solutions for how to, you know, basically improve, um, you know, the, the healthcare situation. Um, and I think uh, education, there's been a lot of work um, as well. I did not have the opportunity to write a chapter on education, um, uh, you know, uh, but 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 uh, you know, I think there's a lot of work that's been done on 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 uh, on India in the in, you know, especially on governance side. People like uh, Karthik Muralidharan, for instance, have done good work in this, which you can go and refer to. And I think India def definitely has to actually think far more about its human capital. Um, I think it's a area which basically requires years of investment, but I think the returns do certainly come. When the returns come, the returns actually are, are, are disproportionate, are very high. Uh, but I think that is something which is very, very important, cannot be emphasized. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I'll end the response to the question by giving you, you know, an example of, um, because you framed the second part of the question about thinking for India. And that's something which I was going to cover. Um, you know, uh, just quickly, I'll take you through a couple of um, slides on the Indian fiscal response. Um, you know, <clears throat> let me just show this. So if you look at, um, yeah, so, you know, let, let me, before I share, let me just mention one thing. See, if you look at the inflation scenario, um, you know, globally, um, Compared to, let's take two crises. Let's take the global financial crisis. Let's take the COVID crisis. Um, the after the COVID crisis, Western economies have felt very high inflation. You know, you know after after global financial crisis, they didn't face it that much. Um, India, you know, in contrast, actually had very high inflation after the global financial crisis. Has had inflation that has been actually, you know, has been range bound, has sometimes gone to six, six point, you know, six point one percent, six point two percent, etc. But has very much been range bound. So very high inflation during the global financial crisis, but low inflation, low to moderate inflation during the the the, the COVID crisis. West, on the other hand, low inflation during the global financial crisis very high inflation now during the you know, COVID crisis. For instance, you know, having uh, uh, lived in the US, typically the US consumer expects an inflation of two, two and a half percent maximum, but now they're actually encountering seven and a half percent, seven, seven and a half percent. And after the global financial crisis, inflation had basically you know, crashed in fact. Um, now, why is this? Why is India's you know, uh, macro so different? Because India's policy response was not one that mimicked the Western response. Um, and it's important to understand here that unlike the global financial crisis, which was a shock to demand, you know, it really reduced demand. COVID crisis, on the other hand, was not only a shock to demand, it was also a big shock to supply. It reduced supply significantly as well. Supplies, you know, chains got disrupted. And India's response actually, you know, was very calibrated on the demand side. You know, in the global financial, after the global financial crisis, we did only revenue expenditure for, you know, and for instance, uh, the egregious form of this was the farm loan waiver. And this was under an economist prime minister at that time. 
um, which led to inflation touching close to 17, 18%, double digit inflation you know, for, for, for 18 months. Uh, now think about it counterfactually. And that's where let me bring in the, you know, show you the chart because that's something which will explain very well. Um, <clears throat> so this is basically just um, sort of using a chart explaining. So uh, let's say that this, so the, 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 the solid lines are pre-COVID, okay? So there's demand and supply, okay? Um, now, what has happened actually because of, um, you know, of, of COVID is that not only has demand reduced, and that's why the demand curve shifting, you know, to the left, this, this demand curve here, but supply is also reduced. And so, you know, now what Western economies have done is they've primarily focused a lot more on, you know, on the demand side. So if you increase demand, actually, if you see, if you take the combination of the solid line for the demand and the dotted line for supply, you can see clearly reduced output, but higher price, which basically translates into higher inflation. In contrast, what India, and this is basically explains what, you know, the sort of the, uh, the, the importance of looking at supply and demand both. So counterfactually, think about it, what India would have, you know, would have had if we had just followed the Western template of just doing demand side spending, you know, take the global financial crisis outcomes that resulted, double digit inflation, you know, touching 17, 18%, add to that in the impact of reduced supply. So, you know, India would have, could have faced easily, you know, double digit inflation, possibly even touching 20% on. In contrast, India has had inflation maximum 6.2, 6.3%. And to understand the impact of policy you always have to look at the counterfactual so what could have been if india had not thought you know very carefully and we went back to first principles and basically said we have to think for india you know on its own rather than just mimicking the west and that is why inflation has been actually so much in control you know 6.6.2 6.3 percent maximum um, but but if that is with the huge supply side disruption you know in contrast so just look at the stats right double digit inflation around average of 15% in the global financial crisis, 6% now, which is so 9% lower for India. What happened for the West? Inflation almost close to zero in the global financial crisis, 7% now. Increase of 7% there, decrease of 9% for us. That tells you why thinking ab initio, you know, the, the, the rigor of Western thought, of basically Western methodology, but excellent understanding of the Indian ground realities and the Indian economic uh, apparatus, I think is what has led to, you know, this basically this, this spectacular performance on the macros, you know, following the global financial crisis. And if you look at after the global financial crisis, there was a, you know, taper tantrum. India's was part of the fragile five. In contrast, after the COVID crisis, India has emerged compared to other countries, you know, in a much stronger situation. That tells you the importance of the combination of rigor at the same time, awareness of Indian realities. Thank you for the response, Professor. I think we'll just take two more questions within the interest of time. Um, the first one being, how can the government maximize the impact of its spending given that its taxation already produces efficiency losses and costs the economy in the form of marginal cost of public funds? Further, how do we reduce the value of MCPF, marginal cost of public funds, for the Indian economy? So, Firstly, you know, one of the key changes India did actually was reduce the corporate tax rate. You know, in, in September 2019, uh, we reduced the corporate tax rate significantly. So recognizing very well that, you know, that, that at, the, at those level of taxes, the investment that we want to, want to generate will not happen. And investment through that, the virtuous cycle, you know, would not happen. And that's why we reduce the tax rate. So I think uh, a redu reduction in tax rates, the factor market reforms that have been undertaken, emphasis on, on, on capital expenditure, especially public capex, all these are ways of actually improving the return on, on, on capital in the economy. Uh, we'll just take one final question. Um, so this is an anonymous question that's coming and it says that uh, from what I understand that you are arguing that capitalism and the pursuit of profit is an Indian idea and that socialism, socialism is a foreign import. Now, uh, Nobody is necessarily saying that uh, Indian texts have argued for capitalism or against socialism. However, 
Indian socialism is not necessarily also claiming that it draws legitimacy from ancient scriptures. Um, Indian socialism is partly necessary uh, because the ancient capitalism that has been re uh, referred to in the text that you mentioned has led to deprivation and op economic deprivation and oppression in the form of the caste system. The point is, uh, why is something ancient and inherent better than something that can potentially alleviate the oppression that the ancient has created? No, I think let me be very clear here, right? I actually, I did cover that the fact that, you know, during the imperialist era and socialist era, we actually undermined markets. We went back, went away from our DNA. And let me be very clear, you know, what India is now implementing is, you know, taking those ideas, but to the Indian reality today, as I just gave you the example of the response to the COVID crisis. You know, we have we have basically you know recognized what is important for India today. But I think the response that you know, I I don't think socialism anywhere has actually delivered prosperity. I think the, if you if you look at China moved away from its you know socialist policies, the you know, we we we've seen basically the breakup break breakup of USSR, the entire communist bloc. And I think you know it. See, if if you take look at socialism, you know, I think it, it basically undermines two key aspects that are at the heart of of prosperity, you know, and 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 you know, uh, um, welfare in society, which is private enterprise, the desire for a person to work hard for him to improve his or her, you know, um, uh, 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 his or her uh, uh, situation compete with the, you know, compete with others. Basically, I think these ideas are central to, if you look at, for instance, take your own example, you know, you guys have actually come to a university like Ashoka University, having competed with the best. You know, if suppose Ashoka University were a free for all, um, you know, would you guys basically be, uh, there was no test, anybody, so that's what socialism is, right? That you know, you basically don't. If everybody gets the same same uh, you know outcome, and I'll end with the, I'll give you a specific example that um, because I think this captures. If you if you're interested, take a look at the uh, presentation on the 2021 economic survey. Uh, you know, and the video on in, a chapter on inequality itself. And those who are interested, by the way, go and read a chapter. I think this chapter three or chapter four in the 2021 economic survey on inequality and growth, you know, uh, are they in conflict or convergence in the Indian context? So let me give you the exa as an example. Um, there's a show called Malgudi Days, um, you know, we used to watch when we were kids. Um, so I'm gonna give you the story on socialism, you know, versus basic, basically capitalism using this story. Um, so in one of the episodes, the central character there, Swami, um, comes back from, you know, uh, from, 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 from school, crying to his mother saying that, you know, um, that I, I scored 100 out of 100 in mathematics, but the, the principal took away 20 marks from me and gave it to Shankar who got 60 out of 100 because the principal wanted to equalize, you know, wanted equality. So Shankar got only 60 marks out of 100. I got 100 out of 100. Um, you know, the, the principal basically took 20 marks away from me and gave it to Shankar so that both of us get, get 80. Swami basically cries and says that, you know, um, I'm not going to work hard anymore because 80 anyway, I don't need to work at all. I will get 80 actually without it, without doing any work at all. And, and so he says that, you know, my incentive to work hard to get 100 is gone completely. Uh, you know, Shankar on the other hand goes very, very happy, you know, and basically tells his mother, I'm not going to study anymore because anyway, I'm going to get 20 marks grace. So what's the big deal? Why should I actually, I don't, you know, uh, need, need, need 80 marks, 20 marks anyway, I'm going to get, I'm not going to work hard. So the, the good, good kid who basically, you know, was getting a hundred now gets 80. The, the kid that did not, does not work hard, basically his, his incentive to work hard basically was not there earlier, has gotten even more dampened, but the bright kid's incentive has also gone down. And actually, you know, I, I, there is a tweet. If you go to my Twitter handle, you'll see if you implement this in your own class, if, if any professor implements it saying irrespective of whatever, how much ever hard you guys work, I will all give all of you a B plus in the class. You will see that is basically socialism. What will happen? You know, those who actually get A's in the class will have no incentive to work hard. You know, the A, A, A rankers basically will be the one, ones that will stop working. The, those, who are, those who get C's in the class will basically have anyway no incentive actually because they're going to get B plus as well. That is socialism for you. 
capitalism on the other hand is actually competition you know you guys are at ashoka ashoka university having competed with the best and having come to ashoka because of competition those that you those that did not make it you know basically maybe a, maybe 10 times that if those guys were sitting in your class you know because of the model of socialism i will then ask you how you will respond they may be asking questions they may not be understanding and they were wasting your time that would be the model of socialism think about it reflect on it and then actually again you know uh, reflect on this question thank you for your insights professor it's been a wonderful talk i'll just hand it over to abiral for the vote of thanks thank you professor for uh, taking our time to uh, for this talk uh, we are truly grateful for the opportunity and uh, all the insights we have learned today uh, thank you everyone for joining today uh, we have uh, we'll, uh, we'll share the recording because we have the permission from the professor and finally thank you to all the members of the economic society for working hard to make this happen we hope to see you soon professor thank you so much for the presentation